Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Ocean Robbins, and I am so thrilled to be with you right now and to welcome you to this whole life action hour. Today, we're going to focus on brain health, on how you can optimize it, how, on how you can nourish your brain, on how you can feed your brain so that you can fight dementia and Alzheimer's, and also so that you can have good memory, peak performance, and thrive. And we have the right people with us to help us on that journey because we are here today with doctors Dean Sherzai and Aisha Sherzai, who are phenomenal award-winning neurologists and brain science researchers. Our focus again is simple strategies you can use to prevent Alzheimer's and dementia. And I wanna be very clear with you that nothing you're gonna to hear today is medical advice. This is coaching and insight and education as in all things, use your own best judgment and consult with your own health, trusted healthcare providers about your healthcare needs. That said, we're gonna learn a lot today. Doctors Dean and Aisha Sherzai believe that green, great brain health starts at home. They're dedicated to educating people on the simple steps to achieve long-term brain health and the prevention of devastating diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia. They are directors of the Alzheimer's Prevention Program at Loma Linda University Medical Center. They help their patients adopt brain protective programs that they can follow for the rest of their lives. The Shirzai's first and best-selling book is called The Alzheimer's Solution. You'll find out today about the diet and lifestyle protocols that have been proven to help prevent Alzheimer's and to optimize your brain health for life. Doctors Dean and Ayesha Sherzai, I want to welcome you here. You can go ahead and turn your audio and video on so we can all see and hear you. Welcome. Hi, guys. Hi, Hello, everyone. Ocean. Thank you so much for having us. We're really excited to be here. Well, we are so happy you're here. Thank you for coming and being with all of us. And we have people from all over the world. But now we want to talk about brain health and how you can thrive in your brain. And Dean and Ayesha, you've been in this field for decades. And you've seen a lot. Uh, you've seen the suffering that comes from the status quo. I'm sure you have seen a lot of families torn apart uh, by Alzheimer's and dementia and their devastating impacts. But you've also come to have a lot of hope. So I'd like to hear if you could tell us a little bit about how did you, I, I think that you, know, you, you grew up in the system, right? That, that kind of has its conventional ways of thinking which yeah. include that Alzheimer's and dementia are kind of mostly genetic and kind of about luck. And, and yet you've discovered something very different. How did you get wise to the possibility that we had some say in the matter? Yeah, we, we started our journey um, more than 15 years ago and, and in San Diego, UCSD, <clears throat> and I did the work at NIH, uh, Experimental Therapeutics Branch. It doesn't get any more molecular uh, than that. And uh, looking at study after study, failure after failure, uh, we were getting disheartened, especially since we both had two grandparents each that suffered from dementia. So we, we decided to take a risk. And, uh, and we were told by our mentors, which was the Dr. Leontal and others who were the great minds of, of the field of neuroscience, uh, that if you take this path, it's going to be a suicide, career suicide. But we said, you know, it's important to take a different look at this. So we looked into populations where people lived healthier and, and better than everybody else. So one of the places, which is one of the only blue zones in America, Loma Linda, um, uh, it, nobody had looked into the brain concept. They had looked at diabetes and heart disease and other diseases. And in all of those, uh, you know, a certain type of food lifestyle actually significantly reduced the risk of the other diseases. So we came in uh, we were the directors of the brain health uh, in Loma Linda, and we did a lot of work in the community. We speak in churches every week, uh, weekend, and in community centers, and we looked at the prevalence. And just overtly, initially, there was a profound difference between populations that had more to do with socioeconomic and environment and access. You know, all public health is about access than anything else. Genetics did not play the game. So then we started looking looking into it much deeper. And when you look at it deeper, it becomes absolutely obvious that it's more lifestyle than genetics. And we'll talk about the, the, the genetics uh, have a very small percentage uh, of input into this disease. Wow. That kind of turns conventional thinking on its head. 
It does, it's especially yeah. for the most important organ in the body, which is the brain. Absolutely. So where in the world do people have the lowest rates of Alzheimer's and what level, do, how does that compare to what we see in the United States? So there are many claims there. There's claims that India has had some of the lowest uh, rates and as certain other populations, including such as Nigeria, which has one of the genes that have been often associated with Alzheimer's, yet they had lower rates. And then, of course, in, in our clinic, and in, in Loma Linda, where we were the main dementia clinic, where 25,000 people live and half of them have a particular type of lifestyle. And when we looked at the, the prevalence of dementia in the 3,000 patients we saw, out of the 3,000, and I think I'm gonna give away the, the, the diet at this point or the food or lifestyle, out of the 3,000, only 19 were on whole food plant-based. I mean, that is, bewildering given that half the population is whole food plant-based you would expect just by that the nature of uh, you know presence of the population that you expect 50 percent of dementia patients to have been uh whole food plant-based yet 19. okay i just want to make sure i'm following you here you're saying that in loma linda that it's a blue zone which means it's yes. been documented as one of the places in the world where people live the longest healthiest lives higher life expectancy lower rates of chronic disease than we see in most of the world and across the United States, right? This is in California. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that in Loma Linda, half the population is eating a whole foods plant-based diet. Yeah. And that's credited with a central reason why uh, the life expectancy is so much higher there. And you are saying that in that community where half the population eats a whole food plant-based diet out of 3000 patients that you saw for Alzheimer's, only 19 were eating a whole foods plant-based diet. When if Statistically, given the nature of the community you're working in, you would expect it to be one and a half thousand. Is that correct? Beautifully said. That's why you're the moderator. You're so good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, this had this had been shown by Paul Guillem in 1993. Yeah. 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 The, 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 the evidence is just profound. Um, you almost see a dose response relationship with the kind of foods that you eat and the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. And the more plant-based, the more um, the more organic, the more uh, clean it is, the lower the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And from a neuroscientific perspective or a biological perspective, it makes sense when you look at how food interacts with our bodies. So, and that's why, and that's why where we live in Loma Linda, it's a small city, and right across Highway 10, which is you know a long highway separating Loma Linda from San Bernardino County which happens to be one city. of the city, which happens to be one of the unhealthiest cities in, in Southern California and California in totality. Um, we work half a day in a community clinic in that area. So just kind of traveling from Loma Linda to that clinic 10 minutes later, and you see enormous amount of cases of diabetes and high blood pressure and high cholesterol at a very young age. And you see the discrepancy of disease too. They tend to have more strokes. They tend to have more dementias very early on. And when you look at their lifestyle, it makes sense. Um, that whole idea of prevention and healthy living hasn't really um, uh, uh, connected with the population and it becomes yeah, yeah. a problem of access. So a lot of people listening might be thinking, well, this builds up over a lifetime, right? So. Maybe if we lived a pristine, perfect life from birth, then we'd have lower rates of Alzheimer's and dementia, for example. But what about somebody who's like in their 60s or 70s, who's got a lifetime of certain habits and certain neural pathways? And when we know the kind of chilling research that the, the foundations of Alzheimer's often start 20 or 30 years before onset of symptoms. Nice. So uh, what would you say to somebody who's thinking, is it too late for me? Absolutely not at not. all. No, no, not no. at all. As as susceptible as the brain sounds to be, yeah. or the body is, when given the right environment, it starts healing itself. You actually see reversal of the pathological processes that develop the disease, um, and and we see it over and over again in our clinic. And the reason we're so enthusiastic about what we do and it's so fulfilling is because you get to see those reversals and those changes in people's lives. Now, now let's get this right. A lot of people are making lots of claims and those claims follow with vitamins and, and pills that they sell. No, once the disease is fulminant, I mean, all out Alzheimer's, there's no way to reverse that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there isn't. And, and, and uh, no matter, and that's important that we make that clear because it deals with people's most important thing, 
which is their hope. Yeah, we want, but in early stages and, 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 and in pre-dementia, where it's what's called mild cognitive impairment, absolutely, we've seen reversal over and over again. Right. Yeah. Now, I want to clarify and also ask about this for a second, because um, what are some of the warning signs? How do you, how does someone know they might be facing pre-dementia? Is it, does it start with kind of forgetting what the car keys are, a little brain fog? Does it start with just not having that crisp thinking that we maybe used to have? What are some of the things that people might notice? It's a, it's a very, uh, so we, you know, forgetting your keys, where they are. Well, we all do it. <laughs> forgetting where you parked. It's ubiquitous. That's everybody does that. Forgetting, you know, uh, you know, what, uh, where you uh, are supposed to have a meeting, you know, next week that happens here and there, uh, uh, you know, losing things, uh, uh, forgetting that you left something on a stove. Yeah. Okay. What, if those happen here and there in rare occasions, that's a part of getting older and not just older in the sense that the brain is changing It's becoming, you know, more, involved, more multitasking and distracted. But when you do all of them or multiple of them at a time, and more importantly, if other people notice a distinct difference, that's a sign that something unique is happening. Something different is happening. That's when you should get evaluated. It's because at that stage, you can do quite a bit about it. It's at the MCI stage that you can actually, we believe that you can, for majority of them, you can reverse it if the light, right lifestyle is instituted early enough, especially at the MCI stage or mild cognitive impairment stage. And sometimes the person himself or herself don't really realize that this yeah. is going on. So it becomes a irresponsibility on part of the family, friends, or loved ones who see that individual uh, on a regular basis to point it out and to get tested on, uh, as soon as possible. What are some of the greatest risk factors uh, that people should look for? I mean, obviously you're just describing one, which is behavioral. Are there any others that people should be, I mean, we hear a lot about genetics and if you've got family members who have Alzheimer's, that's a big risk factor. You're saying that in reality, genetics aren't that big a deal, maybe in the grand scheme of things, but obviously they still have an effect. So yeah. what would you say would be uh, place somewhat at heightened risk? So there are multiple factors. Gen Let me just give the picture of genetics uh, a little more clarity. So with the new age of uh, GWAS and all these techniques that we can actually look at the relationship between genes and disease, we know that about 25 genes or, more or so are related to Alzheimer's. Yeah. Only 3% of Alzheimer's is driven heavily by genes. What do I mean by that? That means that if you have these genes, you're going to get Alzheimer's, no matter what you do. Those are presenalin 1, presenalin 2, and APP. That's 3%. What about the other genes? So the other genes give risk and they give you a ratio of risk. Some of them have a little more risk. For example, APOE4. This is the gene that codes for proteins that, that tra uh, for transport lipids and fats. If you have one gene from one parent, your risk goes up four times. If you have two, one from each parent, as much as 12 times or more. Now, does that mean that people who have two genes will get the disease? Absolutely not. 50% of them never get the disease. Why? lifestyle. What about the other genes? Again, the other genes are lifestyle genes, meaning your body's response to vascular risk, where your body's response to immune uh, challenge, your body's response to getting rid of waste. So they give you a range. And what you do in life determines if you're going to get it earlier or much, much later, way well beyond your normal uh, life cycle. So that's how genes play into this. Now, what are the other risk factors? Smoking. You reduce smoking, you significantly reduce uh, uh, alcohol, alcohol abuse, definitely, head trauma. But other things are things like saturated fat, profound risk, sugar. We're talking about refined sugar as far as foods are concerned. That's how we look at it, high glycemic foods and high fat foods. Then we have physical activity. The reverse of that is good physical activity is incredibly protective. And then stress. Yeah. Stress is tremendous. And so as we see anxiety or a lifetime of anxiety being one of the big drivers of cognitive decline. So figuring yeah. out how to treat that, not just pharmaceutically, because that just hides it, but um, uh, functionally. Yeah. The fourth is sleep. Oh my goodness. We are, we're doing one of the largest studies in the country right now, not just sleep apnea, which is where you're not getting oxygen, Yes. but even poor sleep increases your risk significantly. Yeah. And you can't hide it with just medicine because if you give medicine, 
you might not be going through those cycles of sleep, which is which are critical for cleansing. And last one, and most important, and we would love to say nutrition and exercise, is mental activity. Yeah. Uh, challenging mental activity. Absolutely. Cool. If you don't lose it, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? Absolutely. It's true with our muscles and our bones, and it's also true with our brains. Well, especially it's true for the brain. Your yeah. muscle, when you work out, you break muscle, you double the size. Okay. If you're really good at working out, it hasn't worked out for me really. But, uh, uh, but for brain, let's look at the numbers. Yeah. We have 87 billion neurons and each neuron can make a couple of connections or as many as 30,000 connections. That's where the protection comes from. Wow. Yeah. The occupational complexity or people who have had very complex and challenging jobs seems to be one of the most protective factors, even if they have pathology of Alzheimer's going on in their brain and they have a challenging and a complex life, the disease actually doesn't manifest itself. And the most challenging seems to be interviewing interviewers <laughs> that are very hard to wrangle. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> so I'm curious, it seems like you are saying that as two of the most esteemed neurologists in the field, you are telling us that if you wanted to assess somebody's risk of Alzheimer's more significant than family history, maybe even more significant in most cases than genetics, you would look at what their lifestyle looks like right now and what it's been, right? By all means, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Okay, so yeah. then let's, let's go there. Let's get a little more specific because you, you just gave a lot of kind of high level and I wanna drill down so our participants can really take some action here, okay? Mm -hmm. so. Um, Obviously we're food revolution network. So let's start with food. You mentioned avoiding saturated fat. Well, you know, what is the studies, what do the studies show us about rates of Alzheimer's and dementia and how they are impacted by some of the specific foods that we should be avoiding and some of the specific foods we should be eating more of? Sure, so in terms of saturated fats, there's a tremendous amount of data that shows us that if individuals consume saturated fats on a regular basis, their risk of Alzheimer's disease uh, or dementia goes up. So just to define what the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's is, dementia is the, large, the bigger category. It's when people have difficulty with their memories and cognitive capacity to the point where they can't do their activities of daily living. And Alzheimer's is the main type of dementia. You know, 60 to 70% of all dementias are Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we have had studies from about 20 to 30 or 40 years ago showing that populations or individuals who have high amount of saturated fats in their food tend to have higher risk. Let's take Loma Linda, for example. Back in 1993, Dr. Paul Guillem, he was one of, one of the scientists in the university in the Adventist Health Study, which has 50% vegetarians and 50% non-vegetarian, saw that people who consume sources of high saturated fats, including meat and poultry and high fat dairy, tended to have double the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease compared to those who didn't consume saturated fats. The same thing goes for um, uh, other studies like uh, the, mi the MIND study or the, the study that was done in Rush University. They created a dietary pattern called the MIND diet, which was a hybrid of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. Low in saturated fats, high in plants, low in salt. And they found out that people who consumed that dietary pattern actually reduced their risk of Alzheimer's disease by 53%. And even a moderate level or moderate adherence to the diet reduced the risk by 35%. So incredible numbers. And um, again, if people actually have high uh, cholesterol levels during their midlife, midlife seems to be one of the most important times of our lives for us to address these risk factors. High cholesterol levels in our blood tended to increase risk of dementia as well. Yeah, um, the study that you did in California Teachers Study, which is the largest study in the country. Right. She won the American Heart Association Award for this. Um, 133,000 people. Yeah. So I, I, that study was initially done for me to kind of parse out the Mediterranean diet because you know you hear about that all the time and everybody thinks it's probably because of the fish or because of the olive oil, um, and that that definition has been used by multiple populations in different studies. So I wanted to look at what Mediterranean diet meant and yeah. when you parse it out and you do factor analysis, which means what foods actually stand out as far as their protective effects are concerned, it was all plants. It was the greens, the beans, the blueberries, the nuts and seeds. 
and you get a low score for foods that are high in saturated fats. And in, in my analysis, I wanted to look at stroke because stroke or you know, lack of oxygen supply to the brain is associated with dementia and vascular dementia as well. And in, my, in this population, in my analysis, um, that plant-based component of the diet reduced the risk of stroke by 44%. 44%. And the wow. beautiful thing was it was not an all or none phenomenon. Every small change towards that diet reduced the risks uh, incrementally. So for people who are just starting, I think that's great news for them to know that even the smallest change they make in their diet matters a lot. Wow. Fascinating. Thank you so much for that research and for telling us about it. This is profound. Uh, I'm also aware of studies showing that people who eat the most greens have in one study, 11 more years of healthy brain function, blueberries added two and a half. Absolutely. And yeah. So those are some of my favorite superfoods. Yes. Uh, they're obviously good for other things too, besides just our brains, but the brain connection is pretty strong. Our we, so, yes. we say that if you take care of the brain, you've taken care of the body because this three pound organ, where is the brain? We have the brain here. The three pound organ <laughs> the kids took it away. Yeah, the, the, uh, is 2% of body's weight, but consumes 25% of body's energy and up to 50% of body's oxygen. Yeah. So this is an, an organ that's overused, overpowered. So whatever you give it can make the brain or break the brain and yeah. on a, a meal by meal basis. Yes. Yeah. You talked about saturated fat. And this gets into one of, I think, the more controversial topics in our space, which is I want to talk about coconut oil. We've heard a lot of different opinions on it. There are people telling us that it is actually really helpful for brain health, MCTs, et cetera. It's obviously one of the most highly saturated foods in the human diet. Um, and I sometimes wonder, we, we talk about saturated fat sometimes as if it was synonymous with animal products. And there are a range of challenges that come with animal products. Some people say it's a saturated fat. Other people say it's the protein. Other people say there are other elements to it that are causing a lot of the health issues that we see with people who consume more of them in general. But coconut oil is obviously not an animal product. However, it is highly saturated. Uh, what do you think about it from a brain perspective? So, um, so like we said, saturated fats, any source of saturated fat seems to cause trouble um, in the brain. Um, yeah, granted that coconut oil is, you know, more than 70, more than 80% saturated fats, um, the MCT component of it is still under study. We don't have robust, strong data stating that MCT oil is actually healthy. It, the, 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 the studies that have looked at MCT were very short and they were randomly selected populations. So we're really looking forward to seeing validated, reliable data on uh, MCT oil. But to consume olive oil with all of its saturated fats and some MCT oil is essentially like you saying- mean coconut, right? You said well, olive, but- Yes, yeah, coconut oil is, yeah. is saying like, yeah, you know, Coke is a great source of water for you. Well, it has other bad things in it that could potentially harm you. Um, and the way the brain works, um, if I wish we had actually a visual of the arteries and the capillaries or the small blood vessels that supply nutrition and nutrients to the brain, they are so tenuous. They're so small. They're the size of your hair. And the inner lining or the walls of these arteries and the capillaries are very susceptible to inflammation and oxidation. And if people consume saturated fats, forget about getting it to the brain. On its way to the brain, you are actually damaging a lot of these blood vessels that are responsible for proper functioning of the brain. So let's break it down a little further. The, this whole concept comes from the idea that somebody has propagated that your, your brain is made of fat, therefore you need fat. There's so much wrong with that. It's almost like the paleo thing that the people didn't read the, that the people didn't live past age 30. Your brain is made of fat. It's not. It's got just like every other body part. It has all the cellular elements. It has a little more fat because of the myelin sheet that covers the nerves. But that th those states or those functional uh, elements are created very early in life, and they're maintained from within the brain. The brain itself makes its own fat. The brain it actually does not allow external fat to readily cross the blood-brain barrier. So the idea that you're, the, the, what they're trying to make you visualize is that it's a fat-hungry organ. It's not. It's an energy-hungry organ. 
The only fat that it needed was in the development stage that it actually acquired and the rest it creates on its own. And what it needs is good, clean, slow release energy. That's it. The rest is a ju- what I call mental jujitsu people are trying to do to, to, to negate the fact that the brain is in a static state that has been developed very early on, um, you know, as early as five years of age, but then develop, development continues to age 21 with myelination and everything else. And then it's almost a steady state organ that you give it energy, you give it proper energy so you don't create inflammation. You give it slow energy so that the energy level doesn't go up too quickly, like, you know, with ketones or, or sugars. And then and only then the brain function is at, at its optimal level. And is it at its optimal level, which only 0.4% of population of the United States, that number just should bewilder people. Only 0.4% of the population of the United States is eating healthy for the brain. Imagine what you could do, especially among children, yeah. if you feed them the right food. Since we're talking about fat, I think it's important for us to know, Dean actually brought up a really beautiful point saying that, you know, the, the fat is actually part of the structure of the brain. The myelin sheath is all fat. And we don't need to supply it more to actually maintain that. The only type of fat that the brain needs constantly are omega-3 fatty acids. And they're small enough to cross a blood-brain barrier. And you get it from nuts and seeds, from greens, chia. and uh, from chia seeds. And from, a, you know, potentially, if somebody's not eating a wide variety of vegetables, nuts and seeds on a regular basis, from a, uh, from a source like, you know, like an algae-based, an algae-based omega-3 fatty acids, DHA, um, that can actually be really healthy for the brain. Yeah, and I wanted to talk about that a little bit more. And we'll, we'll be getting to various questions from our uh, Whole Life Club members as we go here. Jackie said, I hear omega-3, DHA, and EPA are healthy for the brain. I take ground flax seed, chia seeds, and walnuts every day. How much should one take of each? Is there a limit to how much one should take per day? In other words, can you get too much omega-3s? Uh, and can supplements help? You're already touching on this, but could you get a little more specific on, obviously we're not all the same, but in general, what are some guidelines for how much uh, chia seed, flax seed in particular, and also perhaps if someone's gonna supplement with DHA or EPA from an algae source, how much should they be taking? Absolutely. Oh, I think I think those are great sources of um, omega-3 fatty acids. They're very high in calories, so you know if you are concerned about your calorie intake, be careful. Like I like you said, um, Ocean, we're all different, but you know if one can add at least you know one to two tablespoons of flax in their meals, maybe a handful of nuts every day, not more than that. I think that would that would suffice. Um, since we all live very busy lives, and especially you know with our growing kids and our schedules, we always try to supplement with an omega three DHA EPA supplement. And you know, getting at least two hundred and fifty milligrams of DHA per day uh, is is enough. Yeah, and just to be clear, in case everyone isn't already aware, um, there are the the omega three fatty acids. Uh, the main ones are ALA, EPA, and DHA. ALA is available in a, a number of plant foods, particularly in chia seeds and flax seeds. Those are the strongest sources. Um, and uh, the body c- can convert ALA to the EPA and DHA that are also needed for healthy brain function, but different people convert at different levels of efficiency. And Absolutely. so uh, one of the factors in that is getting your, D- your omega-6 levels not too high. So a lot yeah. of bottled oils high in omega-6s can actually decrease your conversion efficiency. And it seems that turmeric is also helpful in uh, conversion. That's one of the reasons why I think people in India who eat a lot of turmeric and tend to eat traditionally a more plant-based diet might have had lower rates of Alzheimer's traditionally as well. Although it sounds from what you were saying like there's a little controversy about that. Um, In any case, I think that um, it behooves many of us, perhaps most of us to be taking a, a DHA and EPA supplement regularly. Some people may choose to include fish, which is also a nutritional source for that. Obviously, there are challenges with the overfishing of our oceans, with the pollution, heavy metals, et cetera, in the fish. Some people have ethical concerns, um, but that's another option for people who don't want to take a supplement and who have no ethical problem with it and who choose to eat perhaps the low mercury, high omega-3 options. So just like to share what the science is telling us on this. Um, And uh, let's get to another uh, nutrient couple nutrients a lot of people are interested in. Robin said, can low iron and low vitamin D affect the brain in terms of memory and thinking? 
so, uh, so vitamin D, there's a very strong relationship recently that have been found between vitamin D and brain diseases in general, such as MS, one of the stronger ones, and, and also cognition. Uh, definitely lower vitamin D levels uh, are related to, uh, uh, and this is fairly new information. Um, in, in California, where we are in, in Redondo, where there's sun 300 days a week or more, actually, you would think that there wouldn't be any vitamin D deficiency because you get a conversion in your skin. But we check vitamin D levels and about 10 to 15% of my patients have low vitamin D levels. Part of it is conversion. As we get older, we are not as efficient. And, and there is a relationship with cognition. And we're studying that. Others are studying it much more so now because it's a new concept. And we definitely think there's a relationship. So check your vitamin D levels. Don't just take it ad hoc. Uh, you know, that's why we, we're not a big pill pushing, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, clinic in the sense that we want to make sure that somebody has a deficiency before we, we say that they should take it because these are not completely benign. Uh, all, the, all of these, especially vitamin D, except for there are several A, D, E, and K. Uh, vitamin A, D, E, and K can become toxic if you take too much of it. So it's critical to know your levels and supplement if you, if you have low levels. And it's not going to be just taking, be getting in the sun. Sometimes that's not enough. So it's critical to check. And the same yeah. thing goes yeah. for iron too, you know, making sure that you're deficient and not to take it just ad hoc because there've been studies that iron supplements, the specific types of it can actually deposit in brain cell and have been associated with degenerative disease of the brain like Parkinson's disease. But if you're low, I think it's best to, you know, uh, consider taking a non-heme iron on a regular basis in the diet because, you know, that actually affects perfusion or blood circulation in the brain. Non-heme iron. Can you tell us, uh, for those who don't know the difference between heme and non-heme iron, uh, briefly, why you say non-heme? So, so a non-heme iron is the source is a plant source of iron, and it, it doesn't necessarily have all the other uh, components that could potentially, you know, cause harm in the brain. Non-heme irons are, you know, uh, present in greens, in nuts and seeds, in certain other types of foods like molasses. Um, and, you know, eating those um, can, can actually increase your, uh, your iron levels. And, and heme iron can also be a source of oxidation, um, oxidative by, byproducts. With the four processes that we say actually causes damage in the brain is energy dysregulation, lipid or fat dysregulation, inflammation, and oxidation. Right. So uh, that's a critical component because of its uh, electron valence. It can actually cause a whole cascade of damage. That's why we say non-heat. Yeah, and, and the reality for those who don't know is that um, too much iron may cause more damage collectively to our population than too little iron. Mm -hmm. And heme iron kind of forces its way into your body, whereas non-heme iron, your body will actually absorb it at different rates depending on what you need. So there's this brilliant capacity your body has to say, yeah, I want that, I need that when, you, when it does with the non-heme iron, or to say, no, thank you, and, and not absorb it if it doesn't need it. Uh, so your, your absorption levels will go up or down, but with heme iron, it kind of forces its way through. And so it's much more likely that you'll get an overdose and uh, that can be seriously problematic. And a lot of people are suffering as a result of getting too much iron in their diets or in their, in their lives. Um, we have a question also from Robin about how a sedentary lifestyle affects the brain. You talked a little earlier about movement and exercise. Can you talk about how, so those, so we can understand how does that play out uh, in terms of how it affects the brain? And also for those who are wanting to move more in their lives, do you have any suggestions for helping that happen? So of the five things that we talked about, nutrition, exercise, stress, and uh, sleep and, and mental activity, Three of them create the environment. Uh, the environment has to be you know, conducive for brain growth, for brain connectivity, to you know, the axons to connect, the dendritic connections. And the two, exercise and mental activity, actually make those connections. Exercise is so much more important than we thought because we know that people who exercise actually grow their brain. Now, this is in the context of a brain that after age of 25 or so, that number is, you start losing brain cells especially in certain very vulnerable areas, you're like your hippocampus where your memory is formed, you start losing cells year by year by year. But people that exercised actually grew their brain. Multiple studies that shows that aerobic exercise where you got tired, 
Now, let me clarify that. Every time we talk about exercise, my patients say, oh, Dr. Dr. Sherzad, don't worry about it. I, I, I exercise a lot. What do you do? You know, I garden, I walk the neighborhood. I said, that's fantastic, but that's meditation. You got to get tired. You got to get short of breath. 25 minutes, five days a week of real significant exercise. Of course, checking with your doctor to make sure there's no uh, contraindication. That has been shown to actually reduce your chance of dementia and specifically Alzheimer's by more than 40%. Yeah. A, a study recently, brisk walk, 20 minutes of brisk walk reduced your chance of Alzheimer's by 43%. That's absolutely remarkable. Do we have a drug that does 1%? No. Yet brisk walk did this. And by the way, in this case, as opposed to the nutrition, there's no controversy. Nobody's saying that no walking is good for your brain. So this is a easy thing that anybody can do. And what we say is speaking to the vitamin D and speaking to sleep. One of the best things you can do, early morning brisk walk in daylight. You take care of your sleep cycles. You put mm -hmm. it back in the, you take care of vitamin D and light and you do your exercise. That's one of the best things you can do. The second thing is leg exercise that you actually looked into. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, you know, most of most of us think that exercise is essentially aerobic activity, but um, a lot of scientists have looked at strength exercises. You know, like building your muscles, whether it's in the arm and the leg, and that uh, potentially reduces inflammation. It actually creates um, more uh, growth hormones. There's a growth hormone called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, that is the juice that creates those brain connections. And you get a lot of it when you exercise. And there was a study that showed that people who have bigger leg muscles or do a lot of leg exercises actually have a bigger brain. There's a part of the brain called the hippocampus, about the size of my thumb, and it's responsible for encoding of uh, memories. And that actually grows in size when legs are strengthened. So we have we have so much evidence. And with regards to sedentary activity, because you brought it up, you know, sedentary activity is almost the new smoking. Um, yeah, yeah. If if people exercise, say for example, twenty or thirty minutes um, in the morning, and then they have a desk job and they sit for about six to eight hours, they actually negate all that exercise they did earlier in the morning. So the rule is to keep standing up every hour, walking around and moving constantly to you get rid of sedentary activity. And, and just to cap it off, the, the one thing more than anything else that we've seen that got rid of that fog, that, that, that when patients come to us and say, I have a, this fog that, that's come over my mind, is when they started exercising. Because it's a, bl a, fl a, bl a flow of blood into the brain and flow of BDNF and other factors. And the other thing that exercise does for the brain, it actually modulates your, your neurotransmitters as well as your growth hormone, as well as you know, your BDNF and everything. So exercise is one of the best things you can do to get a brain fog. Now, you just mentioned brain fog and mental clarity, and I just wanna state something I think I'm assuming, but I wanna hear if you would agree with this that the, in general, the same lifestyle choices that will prevent Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia later in life will also optimize our mental clarity, our, our, our function in the here and now. Is that essentially the case? Absolutely, absolutely. Because you know, if we live a healthy lifestyle and if we do all the things that we just talked about, we create more brain connections that result in cognitive resilience, which is essentially like putting your money in the bank for that rainy day. The stronger your brain is, the less likely you are to experience disease. And it's incredible to see populations who've actually had that kind of lifestyle. Their brains look so much better when they do um, MRI studies. When they take tests earlier on in their age, they have higher score in their neuropsychological testing. So yes, absolutely, it's the same concept. For your population that are in their 30s, that usually, you know, younger people, they're, they feel immortal and they think that not, you know, nothing is affecting them. <laughs> Cognitive decline starts rapidly in your 30s, actually right. late 20s. This is where you can actually go down in cognition measurably or maintain and increase your cognition. When I say increase, I literally mean that. We talked about, the, people say we only use 10% of our brain. No, we use 100% of our brain at 1% efficiency. What if we can increase that efficiency with good food supply that gives it an appropriate amount of energy in the right way? 
What if we can increase the blood flow in a way that it actually gets to all the billions of capillaries? What if we can give it the restful sleep, sleep eight hours of paralysis? Why would evolution have put us through this unless there was incredible benefit? It's the only detox that we know of, well, that and water, that detoxes the brain every single night and, and recollates all of the memory and organizes all of the memory. So you can, it's a critical that people who are in their 30s even understand that they can take the path where the decline starts now or actually increase cognitive function as we go forward. Yeah. You know, you're talking about sleep and I just want to speak a word to that. Uh, I notice sometimes that my best insights come when I first wake up in the morning, like my first thoughts. And they're out of the blue, so to speak. They're often not the level of consciousness I had when I went to bed. And there is something about the surrender, the release, the letting go, the entering into the dream state, perhaps, that my, my brain uh, lets go of all the patterns and assumptions and belief systems and repetitive thoughts that occupy much of my days. And there is a space created. And in that space, new epiphanies, new ideas, new perspectives can emerge. And I, I think there's something profound about that. And I wonder if you could speak to that from a neurological perspective. The, it is the most important thing that we can do because majority of us might get eight hours of sleep, but we're not getting, you know, delta deep, deep sleep where the brain actually gets into the state of calmness and what you call surrender or what we, what we can call it. But what it is, is allowing the creative centers of the brain to flow. So the frontal lobe is a great, great addition to the brain. It actually, one of its functions is to inhibit it, stop us from doing things. You know, you're too hungry, you stop and, and, and don't eat. You, you're angry, you don't, you, know, you don't do what comes with anger. But it does its job too well sometimes. <clears throat> In fact, we know that it does its job too well for a lot of people. In fact, many of my patients who have frontal temporal lobe dementia where the frontal lobe has atrophy, guess what? At that late stage, all of a sudden they get this incredible artistic capacity. Where did that come from? The inhibition goes away and all of a sudden from underneath something that was there in childhood just comes to the surface. What if we can access that every day? You know how you access that every day? By getting deep restorative sleep, by allowing the brain to get to that lower state of, of, of comfort where it's actually cleansing the brain, the microglia is cleaning the brain at that state. That's important, yeah. we need that but also allowing the brain's creative centers to come to the, to, the, to, the, to the front. That only can happen, not through medication, but through deep restorative sleep. So a lot of people might be thinking, I lie awake in bed at night, stressed out that I'm not getting deep restorative sleep. It's one of those things where you can't will yourself to relax. So do you have any tips for people on how to create the conditions for deep restorative sleep every night? I think it's one of the habits that takes a very, very long time to get to the point where the person is experiencing that and they should give themselves a longer time to get rid of it. The most important thing is, you know, sleep hygiene and there are multiple elements of it. And that can actually be a completely different session where we actually talk about the profound importance of uh, sleep hygiene. But the first thing is to find out, find out what your habits are. You know, when do you go to bed? When do you wake up? When do you fall asleep when you're in bed? Calculating the number of hours that you are asleep and then finding out things around in the environment that cause trouble with going to sleep. And it can be things like, you know, eating too late or say, for example, drinking caffeine in the afternoon or, think, or, or things like, you know, not having the optimal environment in your bedroom to go to sleep. And we always say your bedroom should be like the best spa. You don't need to go to a spa, just make your bedroom a spa. No light, no sound. The temperature should be perfect. You should consider getting a new mattress if you don't like it. The, the, the type neck of support. material, your neck support, everything matters a lot. And so if people actually make a checklist to see, you know, what are some of the elements in their environment and what are the elements in their habits and what they can fix one thing at a time, I think that would help a lot. The, the yeah. second part of it is cognitive behavioral therapy. This, this running thoughts. First of all, if you have running thoughts, don't stay in bed. Yeah. You have a chair next to your bed, get up, put your thoughts on a piece of note, notebook on a, on, on, on a computer, and not a computer because the blue light yeah, keeps you awake, you on a piece of paper bed. and just put it aside and park it. The bed should not become a habitual thinking spot. 
Anytime you have a thought, get up and, and, and sit somewhere else and write it. That this connection, that separation of bed as a sleep area, as opposed to a thinking area is critical. We have developed over the years, this habit, we go to bed initially is a few thoughts and then many more thoughts. And then it just becomes the place where it actually instigates the thinking process. Yeah. And in a bad way, in an anxiety provoking way. So cognitive behavioral therapy and some other techniques are critical. Now, let me just, two things that we actually approach in a very erroneous way, wrong way. One is meditation, the other is sleep. We think we're supposed to get to the optimal meditative state over, overnight. You need a year of working towards developing slowly by seconds, an optimal meditative state. Sleep is the same. You didn't get to this bad sleep habit and hygiene overnight. Don't try to get out of it overnight. Yeah. Over yeah. six months to a year, sleep hygiene, cognitive behavioral therapy, but it's the most important investment you'll make because those eight hours are literally rebuilding your brain. Absolutely. Yeah. We have a lot of questions from Whole Life Club members and we have limited time. So I want to kind of rapid fire, see if you can answer these in like a minute or less and we'll just right. get to a, a string of them. Um, we have a question from Ralph who said, um, a question is about Alzheimer's and how it's sometimes referred to as diabetes mellitus type three. Wow. What are the parallels between the two, pathophysiologically speaking? Is it possible to measure insulin resistance in the brain? Thanks, you guys are awesome. Thank you, yes. Um, so um, glucose metabolism dysregulation has been associated with Alzheimer's disease. Um, the type, th type 3 diabetes um, uh, terminology was used by a scientist in, um, in Harvard, but it actually is more than that. You can't measure, you can measure brain insulin resistance, but it's not just that, just one of the pathways. There's so many different pathways that one can get to uh, to develop Alzheimer's disease. We did the largest study in the nation actually on insulin resistance and cognitive decline. They can find it on the internet. Okay. Um, what's the study name or what would they Google? Brain insulin resistance and cognitive dysfunction. Um, Dean and Aisha Shirzai. Great, thank you. Uh, Anne asked about drinking alcohol and how it connects to possible onset of Alzheimer's. Uh, uh, Aisha just pointed to me like, I, I'm, <laughs> I don't drink alcohol. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, so the, uh, the amount of alcohol that's good for your brain to the best of our knowledge today is? Zero. Zero. So, but okay. having said that, you know, people who have some anxiety, some nervousness, some sleep disorder, uh, or social anxiety, take getting a you know glass of wine here and there, and if that helps with socialization, if that helps with anxiety, absolutely in that context, yes. But in it itself, there has been no study that shows that alcohol is beneficial to the brain. No valid study. Yeah. Keiko asked about lithium orotate to prevent or perhaps reverse onset of Alzheimer's. Are you aware of any studies or research on that? Small data, there's no legitimate um, data right now for us to you know, um, prescribe it. Okay. Uh, Keiko also asked, I have read about the importance of including whole grains in our plant-based diet, but I've also heard of concerns with wheat. My question is, are organically growing whole wheat products, including whole wheat flour, safe to consume and appropriate for brain health? So, you know, including whole grain and fiber is the most important thing for brain health. But, you know, nowadays we're an ocean. I think you can speak to that more than anyone else. It's very difficult to find out, you know, specifically whether it's, it's uh, organic and that it's not, you know, um, um, adulterated by, by chemicals. But yes, if you have a good source of whole grains that is clean, um, I think that is a wonderful thing to add in your diet. Okay. Um, we heard from Tasha who said, um, are certain herbs or spices beneficial? Turmeric. Turmeric of all herbs and spices are great, but turmeric specifically is wonderful. There have been studies that show that it crosses the blood brain barrier and it's a very potent anti inflammatory compound, especially if it's uh, combined with black pepper, which increases pepper. its, um, uh, its, uh, its bioavailability by 2000%. Yeah. Just to add, you mentioned all spices are, are beneficial in general. There's incredible research on that. And, you know, in, in, the, in the industrialized world, we tend to season our foods primarily with sugar, salt, and fat. Yeah. But throughout the world, 
the hallmark of all ethnic cuisines is the spices. And it yes. turns out that people who use more spices more creatively create more appeal to their food. They have more enjoyment and pleasure. They're less likely to saturate their food in lots of sugars and added fats and you know salt. And they're more likely to enjoy food with the spices. And so the spices displace bad stuff. And they also add incredible antioxidants and, and wonderful benefits to health. So each spice has something unique and special. Turmeric is probably the king or queen of all of them. Um, but there are a lot of wonderful spices and learning how to make friends with your spice rack is one of the most powerful steps you can take. And we had a whole section on that in Whole Life Club a few months ago where we looked at how to really use spices and put them into action in your life. Um, we have a question from Larissa who said, for someone with type two diabetes who's reliant on insulin injections and recently diagnosed with hypothyroidism, possibly Hashimoto's, are they at higher risk for Alzheimer's? And uh, what are the most important things to do for Alzheimer's? If they're unwilling to remove gluten, dairy and meat from their diet, or is it important for them to remove these things? A few questions in there, I suppose. Yeah, yes. <laughs> it's a complex question. Uh, uh, so I'll answer the first part. It is, they are at higher risk, yes. Um, is it important for them to remove the you know, gluten? Uh, gluten, we're not, uh, you know, about 3% of the population that's gluten resistant or gluten sensitive, yes, but the rest, we're not uh, pushing that too hard. But meat and dairy and, and sugars, absolutely, it, it is important. But let's say that you're not even willing to do that. Are there other things that you can do to benefit your brain in the face of the damage that other things are doing? Yes. Well, like I said, exercise can, can significantly benefit the brain. And, and uh, we're talking about the sleep or creating an environment of restorative meditative sleep or deep sleep is critical. And then the last one, which we haven't talked about, which is the most important, mental activity. Challenging mental activity is the most protective thing for the brain. And it doesn't mean Sudoku or some games on a computer. It means real life activities that are around your passion, but are at the edge of stress, at the edge of where you're really pushing your brain. That connects the neurons the most, and that's the most protective. So there, those are some of the things you can do. All right, thank you. Uh, B asked, what are your thoughts on fasting and Parkinson's disease? Mm. And let's talk about fasting in general. Do you think there's benefit to any form of fasting or even giving the, the body a certain amount of time off every night uh, and brain health? But specifically, B's asking about Parkinson's. Um, fasting, definitely, we believe that there's some benefits. Um, there's evolutionary benefit. There's, um, we have molecular data now that fasting has a benefit and even some population based data that fasting has benefit as far as uh, 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 senescence, anti-senescence and longevity genes and epigenetics and all of these things. Um, as public health experts and people that now we have one of the largest uh, studies in the country in beach cities, we're looking at 1700 people. We're doing this, our work through our charity organization in all these different cities where we're trying to move whole populations. We don't focus too much on fasting. We focus on what can be done at large scale. To, tell, to, bring, to bring fasting at the same level as, as, as let's say, whole food plant-based and, and exercise environment would take the noise, take too much of a space. So yes, it works for those who are committed and can do it, but you know what works better? Whole food plant-based exercise, sleep, and mental activity works a lot better and, and, and more effectively. For Parkinson's, just as in for Parkinson's, which is degenerative and um, uh, synuclein disease and other de degenerative diseases, there's some evidence, some is the operative term, that they might be of some benefit. Much more has to be done. I wanted to add and say that there is a lot more evidence of getting rid of dairy and cheese from your diet and its proclivity to develop Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, and dairy Parkinson's. and, par I'm sorry, uh, uh, Parkinson's disease. So just getting rid of dairy products actually does a lot for reducing the risk for Parkinson's disease and even slowing down the progression. We've done a large uh, comprehensive study, I'm um, sorry, review of nutrition and Parkinson's that they can find as well. Wow. So, you know, I just want to say we are so blessed to have you with us right now. And, you know, you aren't just talking because you read books. You're talking out of a lifetime of your own research, working with thousands of patients and studies with hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, you have been such leaders in understanding and turning the light on what the data actually tells us. And we're so grateful, really, Dean and Aisha, for your leadership in this field. 
And uh, now your waiting room has expanded to include the whole world. And we're so grateful to be a part of it. So uh, we're gonna need to complete our time with you soon. You are such a wealth of resource and information, but I wanna, um, before we wrap here, and then we're gonna go into talking a little bit about Whole Life Club, which is a resource to help everybody watching put all this into action. So you can make this happen, not just for a day or a week or a month, but for your whole life. Because at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to, right? It's about habit change, not just getting inspired and passionate and saying, oh, I can do something. That's important, but it's what happens long-term. It's the small steps, incremental steps that take you further and further on the path that really get you the results. And that's why we created Whole Life Club. So I'm gonna tell you more about that in a moment, but before we do, Dean and Aisha, each of you, do you have any closing words you wanna share with us today? I wanted to thank you um, for giving us this um, privilege to have this platform to disperse information about one of the most important organs in our bodies, our brains, and to show people that um, it's all about making you know, small decisions along the way every single day that, um, that helps you you know, take care of, uh, of your, not just necessarily the brain, because the brain is who we are. It's our emotions, it's our personalities, and it actually helps us make better decisions in life. And, uh, you know, as public health professionals, uh, this is the ideal uh, position for us. So I'm, I'm grateful to you and thank you. Thank you. Dean, anything more you want to share? I, I'm not going to, no, she said everything. She said everything. <laughs> <laughs> That'll get you far in life. <laughs> <laughs> thank you both so much we're so grateful thank we're thrilled so to have this time with you 